Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Wednesday Night Bible Study for August 12th, 2020. It is so good to see you guys. Good to have you either watching live or watching on replay today as we continue our journey through the book of 1 Samuel. So I hope this uh, study tonight finds you guys safe and well. Uh, we had a great Sunday this past week. Let me move my camera here just a little bit. Let's see what we got going on there. Ah, there we go. Uh, we had a great Sunday this past week as we celebrated not only back to church, but back to school. And uh, so it has been a very busy week as many of our uh, folks uh, return back to school. So we have a lot of parents that are trying to um, reassess everything, you know, assess everything three days in. Um, we have teachers, we have educators in our church that are kind of going, okay, We've made it three days. There's uh, only 177 left. <laughs> and uh, so it's been, it's been a pretty wild week. So to be able to just come together tonight and just study God's word is really, really awesome. And uh, we had a great celebration uh, this past Sunday morning. And of course, things are different. You know, it's very different being in masks and having to do the social distancing, all those kinds of things that we have to do right now. But that's to keep everybody healthy. And hopefully we won't have to do that for, you know, maybe a lot longer. Hopefully this all will kind of, you know, this virus will get the vaccine, you know, will get effective, you know, a really effective treatment, which seems like the treatment has been pretty good. Um, I'm pleased to say that those that were last week that were sick with COVID-19 in our church family, uh, most of them have, have healed and they have uh, been retested. They've been uh, their tests have come back negative. So that is really, really good. And so we just praise God for that tonight. And we want to continue remembering all those that are um, have been impacted by the virus, of course, and uh, especially those who have lost loved ones as a result of it. And uh, I just kind of want to remind everyone, uh, if you have not yet early voted, uh, early voting has started. So the primaries here in the state of Florida, uh, have have begun through early voting. So get out there and cast that vote. I think we're going to do ours tomorrow. So I encourage you guys to do that. Hey, Aunt Donna, good to see you tonight. And Malachi, my brother, is in the house. Howdy, Pastor, he says. Howdy, howdy, Malachi. So good to see you uh, this past Sunday. And um, uh, I, I tease Malachi all the time. He is he is just one of my one of my buddies, and uh, I just I just love him a lot. And Aunt Donna, you guys see Donna Thornton in there. We call her Aunt Donna. Aunt Donna is amazing. Uh, she is a phenomenal cook, and um, whenever we have any kind of special uh, meals and things here, she's always right there, and she helps coordinate uh, some of those. And Miss Carol coordinates too. She heads up our kitchen here at the church. And Aunt Donna, when we have our uh, Valentine's Day tea, which of course Susan and I were sick this past year. Um, yeah, we think we might have had one. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's going around now. And uh, but uh, uh, anyway, so but she does a great job, and uh, so she loves doing tea parties and stuff like that. So if you if anybody out there is interested in having a tea party, contact Aunt Donna Graham Thornton, and she will take care of you. It was great to be back home on Sunday, praising the Lord. Yes, it was, Malachi. It was awesome. And uh, there was a great spirit in the house of the Lord. I knew there would be. You know, the Bible says where two or more gathered, I'm with, I'm with you. And that is, there was just a, a sense of God's presence in a powerful way. And that was really, really cool. We were a little bit later getting started live streaming and everything. We, if we, if we had any, if we could have any technical glitches, we had them on Sunday. The internet was trying to be uncooperative, but it held out pretty good. But we had no sound in, in, in the house. I mean, fortunately, we had sound, you know, coming into the computer for the live stream, but, you know, it was like, it was kind of crazy. So trying to, Chase that down and figure out what is going on there. And Miss Susie Johnson says, hello from one tired teacher. Yes, she got to see a bunch of little youngins today. So she is tired. So thank you all for being in the live stream. I know not everybody watching is in the chat. I just want to thank you. Um, sometimes people ask, they say, well, why, you know, why do you say a certain number of people are watching? I don't see them in chat. The reason for that is, is if you are watching through YouTube, um, or depending on whether you're watching through YouTube or Facebook, you only see the viewers from that particular stream. I get to see the number of viewers across both, both streams. So, uh, that's really kind of cool. So I can, I can tell how many are viewing through Facebook and I can tell how many are viewing through, um, through, uh, YouTube. So that's how I have a little bit of a inside information on my end that everybody doesn't always get. <laughs> So, all right, well, let's go ahead and open in prayer. we got a lot to cover tonight. We're covering 1 Samuel. We're going to cover chapters 18 and 19 tonight. So here we go. So let's go ahead and open in prayer. Father God, we thank you so much for your many blessings. 
Thank you, Lord, for the privilege, the honor, the opportunity we have together in your name as we study your word together tonight. I thank you, Father, for those that are watching live. I thank you for those that will be watching by replay. I pray, God, that you just bless each individual and each family in a special way. Father, we ask that you just speak to us tonight. We lift up, God, those that are being affected by the virus and other illnesses around our church family and our community, our state, our nation, and the very ends of the earth. And Father God, we just pray for healing and strength upon them. We pray for the families of those who have lost loved ones during all of this. And, and those who have lost loved ones, not you know due to COVID, you know, people still lose loved ones for a lot of reasons, Father God. And we just lift them up to you tonight. We just pray, God, your peace be upon them. Father, we just ask that you speak to us tonight. Your servants are listening. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's people said, amen and amen. All right. I do want to say something. You don't always hear me say this. If you're kind of in the YouTube community, you kind of hear it. Don't forget to click the like button. There is a there is a thumbs up button on YouTube that, that you want to click. Clicking the like button means that the algorithm in YouTube will share out. The more thumb marks there are, the more YouTube is likely to share out the video. So if we really want to get the videos, which we do, we want as many people to see uh, us proclaiming God's word as possible. Part of it is clicking that like button. So when you click it, it falls into, you know, that like, that thumbs up, it falls into the algorithm. It also counts as a view, which then also goes into algorithm so that YouTube will push the video. And so that's important. You know, it's like those things like, well, why is that? Does it matter? Yeah, it does. It really does matter. Somebody's like, what about a thumbs down? A thumbs down really doesn't hurt you. A thumbs down actually counts as a view, but we want a thumbs up because that way we can make sure that as many people get it. So if you haven't clicked the thumbs up on YouTube, please, please do that. Also on Facebook, please, uh, you know, like or love or sh and share uh, these broadcasts too, because the more we can share, you know, usually about every week we have between 200 and 300 people who view these videos. So it'd be awesome to have, you know, 600, 000, maybe a thousand, even more. That'd be awesome to see that kind of views because that means we're just continuing to take the gospel to our community in the very ends of the earth. So a little public service announcement there as we're continuing our journey through all of these online uh, platforms. All right. If you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Samuel. We're going to look at chapter 18. I've entitled tonight's study, A Madman and a Man on the Run. I don't think we have to think too hard about who the madman is. That's King Saul. Who is the man on the run? That's David. And now we're going to begin to see that the beginning of this 10-year period that David will literally be running for his life from King Saul. And so we're going to look at this, this madness that really... Um, Saul experiences and it goes through as the Bible says that evil spirit comes upon him. And we've we've learned through uh, over our course of our study, it was a very manic, depressive behavior that one minute Saul would be fine. He'd be great. And the next minute, just completely just you know, off the chain. I mean, uh, violent, aggressive, just nasty, murderous, you know. So we saw, we see that major shift. So, but it is, it really is going to drive him mad. I mean, he really is, you know, I don't want to downplay this because I know a lot of folks that deal with um, depression and anxiety and, and other conditions like that, including even manic depression. And so I would certainly downplay that. But this actually leads to a, a madness in um in Saul that is really kind of sad because if you continue to use as we've watched his his life his calling his rule his reign is that God has provided him all the net from physically you know spiritually but it's that emotional aspect he will not trust in the Lord and it's like because he won't trust in the Lord that evil spirit that mana mania that depression comes upon him and just makes him a completely different person. And of course, David is described in scripture as a man after God's own heart. I mean, David is just fantastic. David is going to be one of those people in heaven that I can't wait to meet and uh, sit alongside and say, you know, how was all that? You know, tell us about this. And I bet he's going to break out in a song, you know. So anyway, so that's why the contrast here is Saul and David. And we're going to continue to see that as we move through these chapters. And of course, there is the relationship, too, between David and Jonathan. And that is just such a, a comradeship that we're going to see. They just had a brotherly love for one another. That was that is just one of the most uh, beautiful friendship stories that you see in the Bible. So let's go ahead and get started as we look at this together. So 
If we go as far back as 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 21, the Bible says that Saul liked him very much. Speaking of David, at one time, Saul loved David. and But the king's attitude changes over time, and, and he becomes more jealous, and he's filled with hatred, and he's filled with resentment. And the fact is, as we look at, uh, as we, if we go into, as we're coming into chapter 18, chapter 18, verse 12, verse 14, verse 28, reminds us that the Lord was with David. And with that being said, Saul was not permitted to harm him. Saul tried his best, but Saul could not harm David. The Lord was with David. And remember the 23rd Psalm. And there's great debate about that psalm. Did David write it later in his life? Did David write it early in his life? I believe David he could have written it early in his life, maybe even during this period of time when he said that the Lord is my shepherd. You know, I, I shall not want. He, he said the Lord is my shepherd. In other words, God watches over me. God makes sure I don't, I'm not harmed. That's what a, a shepherd does for his sheep. And so there's that acknowledgement from David that the Lord was with him. And I think Obviously, David would have sensed that, you know, all through his life. But here in these early days, after the anointing that he received from Samuel, there just had to be a um, maybe a recognition that, yeah, God has always been with him and he's always been faithful to the Lord. But this is like a whole new level. Um, I, I remember when I was ordained, I've been a Christian, you know, since I was 12 years old. I had taught Sunday school. I had uh, played piano in the church. I'd done all these things in church, all these ministries in church. But when God called me into ministry and, you know, I, I you know, preached a little bit of that. But then that night I was ordained and the, the men of God laid their hands on me and, and anointed me for ministry. It became like a whole new level. It was just it was just I remember my spirit, everything in me. I literally felt like physically I was hovering over the carpet, you know, over the ground, you know. And so I think with that being said, that's kind of like with David here is that there was this feeling that something was different. He had a relationship with God, but this was like a whole new level. It was a calling. And then, of course, he was being anointed to be the future king of Israel. So, you know, talk about a tremendous calling there. So as we look at this, I want to break this our outline down into four parts. First of all is Saul resents David. Uh, that's the first thing we're going to look at is Saul resents David. And um, we're going to see also that, uh, that Saul uh, plots against David. And we see that Saul literally uh, persecutes David. And then later we see that Saul pursues David. So that's really the outline that we're going to be lo looking at. So first of all, Saul re resents David. And this we see in the first four verses of chapter 18. And we're going to kind of read these in chunks. I'm not going to read the whole thing at one time uh, because it would take too long and then go back. So we're going to kind of go through this verse by verse. That's called expository study, in case you want to know. If, when, a, when someone preaches, like I, I do a lot of preaching verse by verse, that's called expository preaching. So as we're, as we're going verse by verse, that's called a expository Bible study. So that's what we're doing. So as we look at verses one through four, it says, Now when he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Saul took him that day, and would not let him go home to his father's house anymore. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan took off the robe that was on him and gave it to David with his armor, even to his sword and his bow and his belt. To a lot of Bible readers, they, you know, if, when you when we kind of look at stories of David, we just see David kind of as a little kid. And I know I've even seen uh, movies and stuff portray David and Jonathan as being almost like teenagers, you know, or they're basically um, contemporaries of each other. They're, they're roughly the same age and they've just become great friends. But the fact is uh, there are a lot of historians that believe that Jonathan um, was possibly anywhere from 25 to 28 years older than David because they, uh, Jonathan had already won two very, powerful, very uh, well-known military campaigns. Well, he would not have done that as a teenager. Um, so he had to be, you know, some have said he had to be at least 20 years old to be in his father's army. So we know he's at least 20, so he's not a teenager. And the reality is he very well could be anywhere between 25 and 28 years older than David. And the interesting thing here is it says that they were, they were knit together. 
very similar words used between um, Jacob and Benjamin back in the book of Genesis, and is that there was just a a, a bond that was there, and it's a it's a friendship bond, it's a love bond. Unfortunately, you have some today who even want to think you know head goes to the gutter that they had a had a you know a, a homosexual relationship. There is that's absolutely ridiculous because number one that would have been a, an abomination against God, against His Word, against His commandments, and that's just not going to happen. What we see here is a friendship, and you know men can be really good friends. You can have, as they say, brothers from other mothers, right? You can have really good friends, and that's what happened here. And Jonathan, you know, listened to his father, and he took David in his own heart. And I think I don't think Saul really knew exactly what that was going to be. He wanted Jonathan to kind of be an inside source for him. He never expected there to be this great friendship between Jonathan and David. And so when we think about Jonathan was Saul's oldest son. Now, what you think about this, Jonathan was Saul's oldest son. He was destined for the throne of Israel. He would have been the next in charge, next in line. But the Lord had already given the throne to David. So to think that their friendship wasn't unique, their friendship was very unique. Jonathan acquiesced literally the throne, his throne, if you will, to David because he knew that that's what God wanted. Now, you don't see a lot of that today. You certainly don't, and you didn't see it back then either. So when Jonathan gave his official, and think about this now, these were his official garments. He was a, a mighty soldier. He was an officer in the king's army. He is the oldest son of the king. He is heir to the throne. His armor, his very armor is different from a regular foot soldier. And I think if we, you know, it, we may not realize that. You, you kind of watch this in movies and you see that the armor that people wore was indicative. It was their uniform, if you will, just like uniforms in the military today are indicative of rank. But here it was not only indicative of rank, but it was indicative of genealogy as well, being the oldest son of Saul and being the heir to the throne. So it says that he, um, he gave David his armor, even to a sword, his bow, and his belt. So he was acknowledging that David one day would take his place. He was literally giving the kingly uh, robe as he had it to David. And that, that's pretty cool. I mean, if you think about it. Um, but then they coveted with, it, with each other. And we see this played out in chapters 20 and in 23 of 1 Samuel, is that David and Jonathan... Um, that the two friends coveted that David would become king and Jonathan would be second in command. And you know, it's a powerful statement about Jonathan. He did not mind being number two. He did not mind it. And I think that's so important. He did not mind being number two with his dad. He didn't try to overthrow his dad's throne. He did not, you know, when, when, when David came into the picture, he didn't try to take David out to secure his throne. And in fact, whenever you know he saw the anointing of David to be king of Israel, he acquiesced his throne, if you will, to David. He was okay with being number two. And you know, that's important for a lot of people. Everybody wants to be the lead dog, but you know what? It, and we're told, always be the lead dog, be the lead dog. It takes more than just the lead dog to pull the sled, right? You need the whole crew. And he was okay with being David's number two. But see, the problem was Saul was not pleased with this friendship that Jonathan had with David. For one thing, Jonathan was Saul's best commander and he was needed to make the king look good. Now, and already David had David had made the king look good. And we're going to talk about that in just a minute. David had made the king look as good as a king could look, but Saul's not going to see it that way. And Saul was afraid that Jonathan would possibly be like a plant, be like a spy, and would, would divulge court secrets to David. So when Saul discovered that David was already anointed to succeed him, that made matters even worse, and we're going to continue to see that played out. And, you know, this is a king wanting to defend his throne, not doing what was obedient to the Lord, not saying, you know what, this may the Lord's will be done, or, or understanding, because I'm sure Jonathan told him that David was, you know, God had chosen David. It had nothing to do with being obedient to God. It was trying to protect his throne, even if it meant trying to kill the man of God. So he saw David as an enemy. He saw him as an enemy, and he saw him uh, as a threat to his own son's future, because he did not want to see Jonathan not inherit the throne. 
But remember, guys, Saul back in chapter 16 has already relinquished his throne. OK, it's just he hasn't he just hasn't it just hasn't happened yet. OK, but Jonathan didn't view David as the enemy. He saw him as a great friend. But when a leader like Saul, I want you to think about that. You know, we've seen this played out. We see this played out even in, in, in the world today. When a leader like Saul nurtures himself on pride and jealousy and fear, he suspects everybody. He becomes absolutely paranoid. And what will begin to happen is they'll begin, begin to hold up more and more and more and build walls and walls of people around them in order to protect what they have. And that's what really is the is the the anatomical dimension of madness. That's where madness comes in. And we have seen that in leaders throughout history, not only in our own nation, but in nations around the world. But when we get a little further into the um, into the scripture, we see that not only is there this this love situation, all kinds of emotions, but there's also this idea of popularity. Now, look at verses five through seven. It says, so David went out whenever Saul sent him and behaved wisely. And Saul sent him over to the men of war and he accepted in the sight of all the people and all in the sight of Saul's servants. Now it had happened as they were coming home when David was returning from the slaughter of the Philistines that the women had come out of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with joy and with musical instruments. So the women sang as they danced and said, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. There's a proverb in Proverbs chapter 27, verse 21. It says, the crucible of silver and the furnace of gold, and the furnace of gold, but a man is tested by the praise he receives. A great military victory, of course, had happened. David had to, because David defeated Goliath, if you remember, the Israel army was able to completely annihilate and, and defeat the, the Philistines. So a great victory had been won. So just as a crucible, uh, and a furnace tests the metal and prepare it for us for use. So praise tests and prepares people for what God has planned for them. So here the women come out of all the cities, which was very customary, and they begin to sing. But how we respond to praise, and we all like praise, don't we? Everybody likes to be, you know, pat on the back, kudos, attaboys. Everybody likes it. But how we respond to praise reveals what we're made of and whether or not we're ready to take on new responsibilities. I remember right after I first started preaching, and, you know, there, you, you, pastors have, you know, obviously critics, and they have cheerleaders. And sometimes the cheerleaders, you know, they cheer you on, and you want to be cheered on by those cheerleaders, and you love it when you hear a you know, great message, pastor, great, you know, great, da, 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 da. But I remember early on, I had an old preacher friend of mine tell me, he says, you know what? Never lose sight that the only reason why you were allowed to do what you just did is because God let you. And so it wasn't you talking. It was God. It wasn't your calling. It's God's calling upon your life. And I always have to keep that in balance in my own life, not just in ministry, but in anything. You know, if, if, if we don't, if we take praise and all of a sudden we become puffed up with it, we have a problem. There was there's an old there's an old saying that says uh, when you strut you stumble, and that can be very true when you get puffed up with pride. You can start strutting, not pay attention to where you are, and stumble. So here we see that we look at David, and he was he was a complete success, and everybody's recognizing that, but we don't see that he's puffed up. So the women come out. And they start singing a song and they say, Saul has slain thousands and David his ten thousands. Now, when you and I read that, and I got to admit, when I've read that all these years, I thought, well, you know what? I bet Saul did get rubbed the wrong way. You know, his fur got rubbed the wrong way because here these women are coming out. He's the king, you know, and he's they're like, well, Saul has slain thousands, but David ten thousands. Well, the fact is, that's really not what they're saying. Uh, it's interesting when I, as I've studied this and as I studied, you know, there's a lot of writing about this particular phraseology that's used here. It really is a it's like poetry. It was very common for the combination of words of thousands and ten thousands to be used. It is in no way saying that David, the women were in no way implying from a literary song st standpoint that Saul, that David was superior to Saul. David had won the battle, but in winning the battle, it went to Saul's credit. But David, and so David's victory over Goliath gave the whole army 
uh, of Israel the ability to conquer the Philistines. So each soldier's achievement was a triumph of David, but it looked good on Saul. Saul could not see that. Saul became enraged. Look at verses 8 through 11. It says, Then Saul was very angry, and the saying displeased him. And he said, They have ascribed to David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed only thousands. Now what more can he have but the kingdom? Saul has just completely lost sight of the fact that he has given up the kingdom. The, king, the kingdom is not his. He is the figurehead on the throne right now. But David is the true king. And it's just a matter of time. Saul has relinquished his kingdom. So Saul eyed David from that day forward. It means I. He eyed him with anger and envy and hostility. And it happened on the next day that the distressing spirit from God came upon Saul and he prophesied inside the house. So David played music with his hand as at other times, but there was a spear in Saul's hand. And Saul cast the spear, for he said, I will pin David to the wall. But David escaped his presence twice. <laughs> My goodness. John Flavel, who was a 17th century British uh, clergyman and author, he was Presbyterian, he made the following statement. Because this is really, the emotion we're looking at now is this envy and anger. He says, it is a dangerous crisis when a proud heart meets with flattering lips. So when the women sang, it didn't seem to affect David at all. But their song enraged Saul. David was David just did what God allowed him to do. His perspective was right. But back in 15, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 28, Saul had already forfeited the kingdom. But he still asked, why can he have more but the kingdom? The kingdom was not Saul's. His madness, his, his, his double-mindedness is just getting the best of him. So when we see that, Envy is a dangerous and insidious enemy. It really is, guys. It's a cancer that slowly eats out our inner life and leads us to say and do terrible things. Proverbs 14.30 says it's that it calls it the rottenness of the bones. And that's what is happening. Envy is the pain you and I feel within us when somebody achieves or receives what we think belongs to us. It's so sad that Saul could not see this as a victory for all of Israel, and he's the king, so he automatically got the gets the credit, but he was so focused on the fact that somebody else got some of the credit. And it wasn't his son Jonathan, which probably didn't help either, but it was David. And here this shepherd boy, this young man, who he loved, remember now he loved him at one time, you know, who, who would come in and soothe his spirit by playing music for him brought him into his court, said, hey, don't go back to your dad anymore. Just stay here with me. And instead of saying, hey, wow, this is awesome how God is using him. Instead, he's filled with envy. And envy is the sin of successful people who cannot stand to see others reach the heights they've reached and possibly even eventually replace them. And if you think about it, guys, by nature, we're proud. We want to be recognized. We want to be applauded. And from childhood, we've always been taught to compete with others, that there had to be the cream of the crop. There has to be a number one. And, you know, we think that, that just happens on the playground. It happens in the playground of, of work and adults every single day. Dr. Bob Crook reminds, reminds us that everybody wear a sign that reads, please make me feel important. And we live today, if you look at advertising today. What does advertising do today? Advertising tells us that uh, it's owed to us, that we are entitled to it, that we deserve it. And what, and what advertising does is it widens the gap between the haves and the have-nots. So all of a sudden now, you'll have envious people, people who won't you know, compete with the Joneses, like they used to say. People max out their credit card. They buy things that they don't need, like Dave Ramsey says, to impress people that they don't even like. And they'll just bury themselves in debt, just trying to keep up. But envy, envy leads to anger. And according to Matthew chapter 5, that is the first step to mur toward murder. And we have seen many, many people killed because of envy. So this explains why Saul throws his spear at David. David's trying to soothe him. 
you know, we see the scene where the spirit came, the evil spirit came back on him. He's in disarray. David tries to soothe him, but instead Saul takes his spear, which would have probably been sitting by his throne, and hurls it at David to pin him to the wall. And the interesting thing is it says that David left after he'd done that twice. So the first time David, Saul had done it, David evidently stayed and said, hey, man, calm down. It's all right. You're in good shape and continued playing for him. And Saul tried to kill him again. So he tried to kill him right there in the court because he was so envious. And that spirit now, instead of that music soothing Saul, it was just like salt in a wound now. Because this was one more thing. I want you, you know, this is kind of interesting to think about this. This was one more thing that David was good at, right? It was also another way that David had control over Saul. And I never thought about it. that. Actually, just hit me. That just kind of came into my into my mind. Is that when David could soothe him, here was a king who could be soothed. In other words, in a sense, manipulated by this guy that he was already envious of. And that's something. So it is just a spiraling uh, downhill turn of events. And then we look at verse 12. It says, now Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him, but had departed from Saul. So now he is filled with fear. And that is not when a when a leader is full of envy and paranoia and fear. That is a very bad combination. You know, Saul knew he was fighting a losing battle. The Lord was with David. The Lord was right there by David's side. The Spirit of God had departed from Saul. But he tried to keep a brave front. He tried to he tried to impress his officers with all of his authority. But the people around Saul knew this. This was the message Saul was sending throughout his court. Saul is king, and he wants David dead. Saul is king, and he wants David dead. Verse 13. Now we look at not only we look at not only does Saul resent David, but we see that Saul now plots against David. He couldn't kill him in the court. Look at verse 13. It says, Therefore Saul removed from him his presence and made him his captain over a thousand, and he went out and came in before the people. And David behaved wisely in all his ways, and the Lord was with him. Again, we're reminded of that. Therefore, when Saul saw that he behaved very wisely, he was afraid of him. But all Israel and Judah loved David because he went out and came in before them. In other words, what it's talking about here is that he went out and he fought and he came back. That he was he was loved by the people because he went out and he accomplished his mission. Because now, in order to try to get him killed, we're going to see David do the same thing. David is later in his life is going to use the same tactic. David, Saul figures, I'm going to put him as a commander. I'm going to put him in the front line, and he'll just get killed on the battlefield, and then I won't have to worry about it anymore. Very interesting how David will try to play that same card uh, years later. Verse 17 says, Then Saul said to David, Here is my older daughter, Merab. I will give her to you as a wife. Only be valiant for me and fight the Lord's battles. Look at that, the, the Lord's battles. He loves playing church. Saul loves playing church. For Saul thought, let my hand not be against him, but let the hand of the Philistines be against him. In other words, let somebody else kill him because I, I don't want to do it directly. I'll let somebody else take care of it. So David said to Saul, who am I and what is my life for my father's family in Israel that I should be son-in-law to the king? But it happened at that time when Merab, Saul's daughter, should have been given to David, that she was given to Adriel, the Mahalathite, as a wife. Now Michael, Saul's daughter, loved David, and they told Saul, and the thing pleased him. And that was the court, the people in the in the castle in, in the in the in power would have told him. So Saul said, I will give her to him, that she may be a snare to him, and that the hand of the Philistines may be against him. Therefore Saul said to David a second time, You shall be my son in law today. And Saul commanded the servants, Communicate with David secretly and say, Look, the king has delight in you, and all his servants love you. Now, therefore, become the king's son-in-law. So Saul's servant spoke those words in the hearing of David, and David said, Does it seem to you a light thing to be a king's son-in-law, seeing I'm a poor and lightly esteemed man? Think about this. He has won this amazing victory, but he knew that, he, that it was the Lord's battle, and the Lord gave him the victory. Look at his humility there. And the servants of Saul told him, saying, In this manner David spoke. Then Saul said, Thus you shall say to David, The king does not desire any dowry but 100 foreskins of the Philistines. 
to take vengeance on the king's enemies. But Saul thought to make David fall by the hand of the Philistines. So when his servants told David these words, it pleased David well to become the king's son-in-law. Now the days had not expired. Therefore David arose and went, he and his men, and killed 200 men of the Philistines. And David brought their foreskins, and they gave them in full count to the king, that he might become the king's son-in-law. Then Saul gave him Michael, the daughter, as his wife, his daughter as his wife. Thus Saul saw and knew that the Lord was with David and that Michael, Saul's daughter, loved him. And Saul was still more afraid of David. So Saul became David's enemy continually. Oh my goodness, look at that. Then the princes of the Philistines went out to war. And so it was whenever they went out that David behaved more wisely than all the servants of Saul so that his name became highly esteem. When you serve God, God's with you and you serve him faithfully, your name will be highly esteemed among the people. There is just no doubt about it. And that's what we see uh, playing out here. Faith is living without scheming. Okay. Remember that faith is living without scheming. But Paul was better at scheming than trusting God. He come up with all these schemes. You imagine, and that and that's what paranoia will do. That's what fear will do. We're, as a matter of fact, this Sunday morning I'm preaching on the power of fear, and we're going to look at the power of the fear of the Lord, and also look at the power of having a spirit of fear. There's power in that, and we saw that he empowered this spirit of fear, and it it became uh, it just destroyed him. So if Saul disobeyed God. He, he was always ready to give an excuse to get himself out of trouble. Remember, oh, he maybe blamed it on Sam, he blamed it on God, he blamed it on anybody around him. If anybody challenges leadership, he would always figure out a way to eliminate them. So here uh, we see this, he's possessed by anger and envy. He's determined to hold on to his crown. So Saul decides that David has to be killed. So that he sends David into battle. And since David is an excellent soldier, he's a born leader, the logical thing was to give him an assignment uh, for, away from the camp where the enemy could kill him. So Saul made David commander over a thousand men and sent him to fight the Philistines. And he figures that'll be the end of David. But if David is killed in the battle, then that's going to be his enemy's fault. But if he loses the battle and lives, then his popularity would wane. But the plan didn't work because David won all the battles. So Saul saw this as a win-win. If he dies, good, he's gone. If he if he doesn't, if he lives, if he loses, well, then he's gonna, you know, his popularity is gonna wane and I, my crown is secure. But instead, David won all the battles because the Lord was with him and the power of God was upon him. So instead of eliminating David or diminishing his popularity, Saul's scheme only made him greater, a greater hero to the people. And that increased Saul's fear of David even more. And that's what happens. When we try to solve things on our own and not trust in the Lord, we find ourselves farther in trouble than we were to begin with. So Saul had promised, though, to give one of his daughters, Mariab, uh, to the man who killed Goliath. But remember, he had not fulfilled the promise. And that's the reason why it says the days had not yet expired. That's what it's saying. There was still that promise that was there. So the fact, though, that David had killed Goliath was enough for Saul. He now expected David to fight the battles for the Lord. And then he could gain his daughter's hand, Mara, which, of course, Mara was already, um, you know, already given to someone by the time all of this happened. She had already been given to, a, to another suitor. So he then, Saul gives David over to his younger daughter, Michael, who actually was in love with David. Uh, Merab was in love with someone else, evidently. Okay. That was his eldest daughter. And so here is this relationship now between David and Michael. So Saul speaks to David about it and said that he would give him a second chance to claim his reward. <laughs> so once again, <laughs> David's like, okay, all right. Uh, you know, I, I really don't want, you know, I don't, who am I to be your son-in-law, but okay, whatever. So this time he asked some of his servants to lie to David. And Saul says, you know, tell him that Saul likes him and that he wants him to marry Michael and that Saul's attendants agree with the proposal. But David put them all off by telling the truth. He says, I'm a lowly from a lowly family. I don't have any money to pay the bride price. I have no way to pay a dowry. So <laughs> what does Saul do? See, Saul's like, I got this all figured out. So when it comes back to Saul, that David says, hey, I don't even have a dowry. How can I possibly be a king's son-in-law? 
He says, okay, this is what I'll do. I'll send you back to the fight. I'm going to send you back to the enemy. I'm going to send you back to fight the Philistines. So once again, here's another chance for David to be killed. You'll get rid of him at the same time. Saul says, tell David that all the king requires for a bride price, for a dowry, is a hundred foreskins from the uncircumcised Philistines. He said, that's, that's what he requires. So in some ways, they, you know, you think about this, you go, what a bizarre request. But this actually was very common back in this time period because anyone who was not Jewish was called uncircumcised, even if it was a even if it was a culture of people that practiced circumcision, they were still identified in scripture as being uncircumcised. And of course, we understand now today more and more you know, looking at it that uncircumcision represents the Gentiles, circumcision represents the Jews. Now in the New Testament vernacular, circumcision rec recognizes that we've been uh, circumcised, our heart has been circumcised to Christ. So we see that the uncircumcision is the lost, the circumcised are those in Christ. So we see how that meaning has changed. But during this period of time, it was very customary uh, for two reasons. Number one, it would take men out of the fight, okay? You didn't necessarily kill them, you took them out of the fight. The other thing it did is it was an acknowledgement that you had been made a slave to the one who had circumcised you. So even if, even if you know, you know, whether these men, these hundred men, which we're going to see later, these 200 men were actually killed, they probably were, but it also meant that they would become enslaved to Israel. So he says, go out and do this thing. So <laughs> David once more survives the battle, and instead of bringing 100 foreskins back, he brings 200 foreskins back. So now Saul's scheme has failed, and he has to give Michael to David as his wife. Okay? <laughs> so his plan has completely unraveled. David is a mighty warrior. God is with him. So now we see how... you know all, of the, all these emotions that Saul has, they completely control him. And he's obsessed now with the desire not only to kill his commander, not only to kill somebody who he once loved, you know, was a friend of his, someone who is his musician in the court, but now he's his son-in-law, he still wants him dead. But still, David never considered Saul to be his enemy. But Saul remained David's enemy until the day he dies. Until the day Saul dies, David will remain his enemy. But David continues to fight the Lord's battles, and the Lord continues to give him success and to magnify his name above the name of Saul's best officer. So David plays close, close attention to what God is doing in him and for him, and no doubt he remembers these events and is encouraged uh, about them during the difficult days of exile, which will be 10 years. Romans 8.31 says, If God be for us, who can be against us. So as you, you think about at the time when David's going to be exiled uh, for those 10 years, he's going to look back at all these things and see the hand of God. And that's as he's writing, as he writes the Psalms, it is a, um, a, a again, a further declaration and assurance that God is with him because of what he's done. He says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me aside still waters. He restores my soul. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You see in that, that one psalm alone, David's recognition of how God's hand had been with him all his life. And David would also write, Lord, uh, and I think it's in Psalm 16, that the lines in my life, the lines for me have fallen in pleasant places because God is in control. David said, God ordered the ways and the, the, the hours of my life in that like a, like a sacrificial fire that your glory may come down and be manifest in my life. I mean, that's the kind of man that David was. And David, and you and I are, are, are you know, encouraged and stressed to learn that we look back on what God has done, how faithful he has been in our life, that regardless of what we go through, he is right there with us and that we should go, you know, instead of our oh me's, we should definitely be giving those amens. So as we look into chapter 19, we see that now Saul begins this persecution of David in the first 17 verses. 
It says, Now Saul spoke to Jonathan his sons and to all his servants that they should kill David. But Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted greatly in David. So Jonathan told David, saying, My father Saul seeks to kill you. Therefore, please be on your guard until morning and stay in a secret place and hide. And I will go out and stand beside my father in the field where you are, and I will speak with my father about you. Then what I observe, I will tell you. Thus Jonathan spoke, Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul his father and said to him, Let not the king sin against his servant, against David, because he has not sinned against you, and because his works have been very good toward you. Smart words from his son. For he took his life in his hands and killed the Philistine, and the Lord brought you a great deliverance for all Israel. You saw it and rejoiced. Why then will you sin against innocent blood to kill David without a cause? So Saul heeded the voice of Jonathan, and Saul swore, As the Lord lives, he shall not be killed. Then Jonathan called David, and Jonathan told him all these things. So Jonathan brought David to Saul, and he was in his presence as in times past. And there was war again. And David went out and fought the Philistines and struck them with a mighty blow, and they fled from him. Now the distressing spirit from the Lord came upon Saul as he sat in his house, and with his spear in his hand, and David was playing music with his hand. Then Saul sought to pin David to the wall with a spear, but he slipped away from Saul's presence, and he drove the spear into the wall. So David fled and escaped that night. Saul also sent messengers to David's house to watch him and to kill him in the morning. And Michael, David's wife, told him, saying, If you do not save your life tonight, tomorrow you will be killed. So Michael let David down through a window, and he went and fled and escaped. And Michael took an image and laid it in the bed, put a cover of goat's hair for his head, and covered it with clothes. With clothes. Then Saul sent messengers to take David, and he said, and she said, he is sick. Then Saul sent the messengers back to see David, saying, Bring him up to me in the bed that I may kill him. And when the messengers had come in, there were the image in the bed with a cover of goat's hair for his head. Then Saul said to Michael, Why have you deceived me like this and sent my enemy away so that he has escaped? And Michael answered Saul, He said to me, Let me go. Why should I kill you? What an interesting turn of events here. Saul's mind and his heart are so possessed by hatred for David that he admits to Jonathan that he's intending to have him killed. And Jonathan says, hey, now, wait a minute. And he says, look what he's done for you. You know, the hope of all Israel literally lays in the heart and the ministry of David. Yet Saul wanted to kill him. David would conquer Israel's enemies and consolidate the kingdom. Uh, David would gather much of the wealth used to build a temple. He would write psalms for the Levites and sing praising God. God's covenant with David would keep the light shining on Jerusalem, even though the nation's dark times. You know, all these things God had planned for, for David and, you, and Saul yet wanted to destroy him. You know why? Because Satan was determined to kill David. You, you get down into this, you got to say, you know what? This was all demonic. This was Satan's plan. If he could take out David, he would take out Jesus. He would take out the Messianic line. This is a huge uh, picture here of, of Satan working insidiously in Saul to try to destroy the Messianic line. So surely Saul knew that Jonathan would pass the word along to, to David. You know, surely he knew that. That if he couldn't kill David, perhaps he could frighten him to leave the land and never see him again. He says, you know what, just get out of here, scare him, and maybe you'll leave. But Jonathan, when he did report the king's words to David, it suggested that his friend, what? He suggested that David hide until the next morning. And he says, I will speak to my dad on your behalf, which is what Jonathan did. Um, had Jonathan, think about this, had he been a selfish man, he could have helped to eliminate David and secure the crown for himself. But he didn't. He submitted to the will of God, and he assisted David. So Jonathan presents Saul with two arguments. Number one, David was an innocent man and was not deserving of death. And number two, David has served Saul faithfully. He says he's won great victories against Israel's enemies. You know, he's valuable to you. And when the Philistines attacked Israel again, David went out with his men and they defeated them again. But what happened is this continued to arouse his anger. Satan is a liar and a murderer. And because Saul was controlled by, the, by Satan, he broke his oath and he threw a spear. He told David, I won't kill you. Yet when David is in there playing, playing that, that spirit comes over Saul and he throws a spear, David gets out of the way and he runs. And David runs in exile. He is now a man on the run for 10 years. 
But during that 10-year period of time, God would make a leader officially out of David. But then look at David's wife, Michael. What does she do? What does she, what does she do? She helped him hide, right? An interesting thing about here, there's a lot, there's a lot of debate over this idol that she had. Um, this pagan idol or this teraphim uh, is kind of a mystery. Um, it, it seemed that if she put it in place of the bed, that it was as large as a man. Uh, you know, Rachel hid two of them under a saddle in Genesis chapter 31. You know, was this something customary? Was this truly an idol? What was this? But anyway, so Michael, you know. You know, schemes to get David through the window. She lets him down through the window. He escapes. But immediately when her father comes into the mix and says, you know, where is he? She goes, oh, well, I had to I had to let him go because he threatened to kill me. Like father, like daughter there. Huh? Right. She did. She was just as scheming. As Saul in her own respect, her dad was not going to hurt her. It's not like Saul had threatened her. She was much like Saul in that she did not want to be blamed. While Michael was scheming, David was praying and trusting in the Lord. And historians have concluded that Psalm 59 comes out of that experience. I'm going to read that to you. He says, deliver me from my enemies, O my God. Defend me from those who rise up against me. Deliver me from the workers of iniquity and save me from bloodthirsty men. For look, they lie in wait for my life, which they did, didn't they? The mighty gather against me, not for my transgressions, nor for my sin, O Lord. They run and prepare themselves through no fault of mine. Awake to help me, and behold, you therefore, O Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, awake to punish all the nations. Do not be merciful to any wicked transgressors. Salah. At evening they return, they growl like a dog and go all around the city. Indeed, they belch with their mouth. Swords are in their lips, for they say, who hears? But you, O Lord, shall laugh at them. You shall have all the nations in decision. I will wait for you, O you, his strength, for God is my defense. My God of mercy shall come to meet me. God shall let me see my desire, O my enemies. Do not slay them, lest my people forget. Scatter them by your power and bring them down, O Lord, our shield. For the sin of, of their mouth and the words of their lips, let them even be taken in their pride and for cursing and lying which they speak. Consume them in wrath. Consume them that they may not be. Let them uh, be, let them know that God rules in Jacob to the ends of the earth. Salah. And at evening they return. They growl like a dog and go all around the city. They wander up and down for food and howl if they're not satisfied. But I will sing of your power. Yes, I will sing aloud of your mercy in the morning. For you have been my defense and refuge in the day of my trouble. To you, O oh my strength, I will sing praises. For God is my defense, my God of mercy. Isn't that amazing? So read that sometime. That is that is what many believe was a psalm that he wrote during this time. And as you and as you read this psalm, you see Saul's spies running here and there, waiting for David to come out. They're like dogs, you know, snarling and, and lurking in the city streets. So here's a picture of that. So in the morning, when the agents demanded that Michael surrender her husband, she said that he's sick. So you know, she she lied and then goes on to say, hey, he tried to kill me. So I had to let it. I, I let him go, which was completely a lie. Let's look at verses 18 to 24 as we look at now Saul pursues David. So David fled and escaped and went to Samuel at Ramah and told him all that Saul had done. And he and Samuel went out and stayed in Naioth. Now it was told Saul, saying, take note. David is at Nioth in Ramah. Then Saul sent messengers to take David. And when they saw the groups of prophets prophesying and Samuel standing as leader over them, the Spirit of God came upon the messengers of Saul, and they also prophesied. And when Saul was, to was told, he sent other messengers, and they prophesied likewise. Then Saul sent messengers again the third time, and they prophesied also. Then he, he also went to Ramah, and he came to the great well that is at Seku. So he asked and said, where are Samuel and David? And someone said, indeed, they are at Nioth in Ramah. So he went there in Nioth in Ramah. Then the spirit of God was upon him also. And he went on and prophesied until he came to Nioth in Ramah. And he also stripped off his clothes and prophesied before Samuel in like manner and lay down naked all that day and all that night. Therefore, they say, is Saul also among the prophets? 
David goes to Samuel. David flees to Samuel and Ramah. Uh, of course, you know, he knew he could depend on Samuel. And Samuel took him into the fellowship of the prophets. Here, the word naoth means dwellings. And it may have been a section of Ramah, many believe, that was like a school of the prophets where all the prophets assembled. And there, Samuel and David could worship and they could pray and they could ask God for wisdom. And the prophets there would pray for them. But in the midst of this, Saul sends in spies and they come in to report to Saul where they could find David. So then after three times, these men came back prophesying. Saul says, I'm just going to go back. I'm just going to go myself. So he sends three different groups to capture David. They arrive at the place where the prophets assemble. They are immediately possessed, the Bible says, by the Spirit of God. And they begin to praise and worship God. And the Hebrew word prophesy here means to sing songs and praise to God as well as to foretell of, of, of a future events. So who knows? They may have been coming back telling him that David's going to be king one day. So soul soldiers didn't become prophets. They just uttered the words that were inspired by the Spirit of God. And, and, and we don't exactly know what that was. But what we do know is it got Saul riled up enough that he then himself goes to church. Okay? So... God protected David and Samuel by not sending an army, but by sending the Holy Spirit to turn warriors into worshipers. Now, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10, 4, he says the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of this world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. So God turned these warriors into worshipers. So three groups had failed. Saul decides to go. And, and, and so David's presence at Ramah, of course, had been no secret, you know, that you know, they knew where he was, they knew where Samuel was, because a great evidently it was like a spiritual revival had taken place. Samuel was there with, with David, the prophets were praying for David. You know, it may have very well been, it was you know, very noticeable that this was taking place. So Saul gets there, and when he gets there, he's met by the Spirit of God, and he begins to praise the Lord. He takes off his royal robes, and he becomes like any other man, the Bible says, and he lays on the floor in front of Samuel. He lays there naked day and night. And, and here again, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Samuel, but uh, upon Saul. But what happens is he's still a double-minded man. It's interesting to read that this would be the last meeting until the night when Samuel comes from uh, the realm of the dead to pass judgment on, on the king. And we'll see that in chapter 28. But, you know, here again, Saul had, back in chapter 10, Saul had a very similar experience. And, it, and the saying of the people was, is Saul also among the prophets? Here again, is Saul also among the prophets? It's like a reiteration of that. And it comes to show that Saul could be filled by the Spirit of God, and Saul could be around the people of God, but he did not have a life-changing experience. And some have compared him to Judah. And they said, you know, you look at Judas. Judas had all kinds of opportunities. He saw God's hand at work, but he never had a life-changing experience in the Lord. And that's what we saw with Saul. So while Saul was occupied at the school of the prophets, David slips away again from Ramah, and went to meet Jonathan somewhere in Gabea. So David and Jonathan are going to wait, make one more final effort to try to have recon, make reconciliation. And it's going to almost cost Jonathan his life. As James 1.8 says, a double-minded man is unstable in, his all, in all of his ways. Saul is unstable in all of his ways. He's going to try to rule the land and defeat the Philistines while at the same time chasing David and seeking to kill him. The longer David eludes him, the more fanatical Saul is going to become until finally he ends his own life, he ends his own life on the battlefield, lacking the help of the one man who could have given him the victory. You know, wrapping it up, during the 10 years or so that David was a fugitive, the Lord not only would thwart uh, Saul's plans repeatedly, but he even used the king's hostility to mature David and make him into a man of courage and faith, one writer said. While Saul was guarding his throne, David was being prepared for his. I want you to think about that. While Saul was guarding his throne, David was being prepared for his. Envy and strife never end well. They're only one step away from murder. And it was a murder spirit that we see here. I want to bring up a map here for just a moment and let you guys look at it. Let me make it a little bit bigger for you. 
And you can see here, if you um, see between the two line two points here, there's a little uh, like little pink uh, jagged line there, little dotted line. That is um, when David left Gilbea. That's David's escape route from Rama to Gilbea. So it was quite a journey. I want to go back into the chat here for just a minute and say, Darlene, oh, Darlene and Annette's in the house. Good to see you guys. Uh, Susie, I'm your number one cheerleader. <laughs> yes, you are. Saul can't have his cake and eat it too, Susie said. That's exactly right. Susie said, hmm, sounds like David later took a page out of Saul's book with Bathsheba's husband. Yes, yes, he did. He did, smartly. <laughs> she may have just been afraid of what Saul would do to her if he admitted helping David escape. Possibly so, but there was never seemed to be any threat there. You know, um, I think she was just, Conniving. I, I really, maybe she was. I don't know. Uh, and Darnie said, I was thinking about that too. You know, it could have possibly been a situation like that. You know, no one really knows. But what we do know is that she certainly came up with a plan real quick, didn't she? But why did she have those idols too? You have to kind of wonder why she had those idols there. And it kind of plays into this whole idea when you see that Saul would not trust God and Saul did not have faith in God, is that was there always an, an idol there? Was there always something there? Is that maybe even, I mean, think about this for just a minute. Maybe that idol possessed that spirit that would come upon Saul. I heard it said years ago, demons fly in on jumbo jets every day. And the reason for that is we have a lot of people who go around the world and they'll collect idols. They, they use them for, you know, they're using them for decorations and things, but they're idols. And those idols many times have been empowered by demonic spirits. They've been prayed over and, you know, demonic spirits. And, um, we have to be very careful of that kind of stuff. We have to be very, very, very careful of that kind of stuff. So I hope you guys have learned something tonight. I know it was a lot that we had to cover. Next week, we'll be into uh, chapter 20. We'll probably cover uh, 20 and 21. Um, we may even get into 22. I'm not exactly sure. We'll just kind of see how it all how it all works out. But it was great hanging out with you guys tonight for Wednesday night Bible study. Go back and reread these scriptures. Kind of stay ahead if you can. Go back and read the Psalms that we talked about tonight. And that'll kind of give you... Um, and maybe read, you know, read the David Psalms as, as we're going through this and it'll kind of give you an idea of, of where he was and his fault with the Lord during this time. OK, so anyway, just want to keep that out in the forefront that we should always trust in the Lord. Some trust in chariots and others in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord, our God. Right. Lord, our God. Amen. All right. You are most welcome, Miss Darlene. All right. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for your many blessings. Thank you, Lord, for this time together. I pray, God, that you would just use us this week as we take the gospel to the ends of the earth. Father God, may you speak through us. May you empower us through your spirit. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's people said amen and amen. It's been a crazy busy week with school starting, so I didn't upload. I've been doing a series on uh, the, our, the founders of our liberty. If you haven't checked that out, check out those videos. I've been doing little smart, little uh, little short little um I wouldn't call them sermonettes, little studies on our founding fathers and and, and the Bible. And so um, I'll be getting the one out tomorrow. I try to get them out on Tuesdays, so but it's going to be tomorrow before I can get it out. And then don't forget, Sunday morning, um, church will start at 11 o'clock. Streaming will start around 11, 15, 11, 20, somewhere in there. And this Sunday morning, I'm going to be preaching on the power of fear. So I'm excited about that. So I definitely want you guys to check it out. In the meantime, I love you. And I can't wait to um, see all of you in person. I know I've been able to see some of you, some of you in chat. I haven't been able to see in person yet. Hopefully I will real soon. I love you guys. We're going to keep, keep praying for you. Keep trusting in the Lord. And remember to do what your mama told you. Wash your hands. Bye.